Okay, great. Um, so as we go today, uh, please do feel free to share uh, questions in the chat. I will try to answer them as we go. Um, again, uh, thank you so much for joining for our spring 2022 uh, planning session. This is meant to be really a supplement to uh, some of the other resources that are available online to help you guys prepare for elections and transitions and really answer any other questions that you might have um, going into the spring semester which has been, as always, um, a unique and interesting semester full, I'm sure, of many challenges for all of you. Uh, so today, what we're actually going to go ahead and start with is a review of our dates, deadlines, and fees. I think this is really important to start with um, so everyone knows what's going on this semester. You got all this stuff written down, um, and we can see what we're starting with. Um, so if you are current officers, which many of you are today, uh, we did ask you when you signed up uh, what your status was, what you were interested in learning about. And I will say a majority of the people who registered for this session are current chapter officers. So you guys in the pro are in the process of planning elections. Um, and most of you had a very even mix, really, about the stuff you were interested in learning about from some of those topics that we went over. So we're going to make sure that we cover all of them. And again, like I said, have plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, so first up with our dates to know, February 15th, the deadline to hold chapter elections. Um, I will say we know that it is sometimes not always possible to make this exact deadline. Um, if you are in the planning process now with your chapters, please just try to aim for as close as possible. Uh, we ask chapters to hold elections this early for a few reasons. One, our data shows us that a majority of file for Delta law chapter officers are 3Ls. Um, and so we want those 3, 3Ls to be able to look ahead to finals, to graduation, to the bar exam, and not necessarily be worrying about chapter elections in April and May. Uh, two, we want to have chapters to have as much time as possible to properly transition between boards. Um, there's a lot that goes into a transition, which we'll go over in, on the next slide, um, but it, it, we really want to make sure you guys have time to focus on all of that. Newly elected officers don't actually have to take over at February 15th. You can wait until that transition process is complete, but having the election process done in advance is really important. Um, and then another reason why we uh, we want to make sure you guys do this early is if there are any issues with your elections, you know, if, if things become contentious, if they are contested elections, um, if there's issues like lack of candidates, we want to make sure that you guys know, and then by extension, we in the executive office know um, as early as possible so that we have time to help you guys fix those problems and get everything ready for the new year. No one wants to be dealing with that kind of stuff um, in, you know, April when you're getting ready for finals. Um, we have, just so that everyone knows, I did get a question in the chat. The deadline for elections in past years was in March. So if your chapter, if you're looking at this and you're like, we always used to do, do stuff in March, what's going on here, that kind of thing. Um, we have moved the deadline and I do encourage all chapters to move their deadlines, take a look at your bylaws, make sure they're up to date and try to aim for those, those February dates instead of waiting until March, even if it is different from how you've done that in the past. Um, but yeah, up until about two years ago, everyone was doing this kind of stuff in March. And, and what we were noticing is that things just weren't getting done in time. <laughs> so uh, again, then you're looking ahead to this April 15th deadline, which is that deadline to complete the officer transition process. So ideally, you've got two months to really get everyone uh, transitioned, to have all that meeting done, to report that stuff to the executive office, and if you have one to your district justice, uh, potentially also to uh, you know, your school, whoever needs that information, that's that time period to do that. Um, during the officer transition process, the incoming and outgoing officers should work together to create the fall 2022 calendars. So that's why calendars for the next semester are due on this date as well. Uh, this is a convention year, and we are going to talk more about convention later. 
but please know that each chapter is expected to send at least one delegate to convention. Uh, there are two delegates, uh, I'm sorry, there are two <laughs> deadlines that relate to convention and they have to do with delegates and funding. Um, so the first is May 6th, which is 90 days out from convention. Um, and that is when chapters should have selected and reported their delegates to the executive office. Uh, the second date is uh, May 31st, and that year that is when convention grant applications are due. Grant applications are on an individual basis and provide funding for members to attend convention. Um, again, I'm going to go over convention more later, so if this is the first time you're hearing about convention, don't worry, we'll, we'll go over that soon. Uh, next deadline that we've got is June 6th, which uh, first Monday in June, every single year, award applications are due. I highly encourage you guys to apply for awards. Um, it can help you recognize your chapter members, particularly some of your outgoing officers. Um, it can help you, uh, you know, really kind of organize all the stuff that you did that year because the applications will ask you to uh, write out how you did an event. So that can be really helpful for your officer transition process. Um, and I also think it's really important that you get recognition on a national level for all the work that you've been doing. Um, and you can kind of use that as well to leverage with your school. When you receive an award, you might be able to turn around and ask for more funding next year. Everyone wants to give money uh, to award winners. So keep that in mind. Um, and then two more uh, event-based dates that are really far in the future. Some of you guys may have graduated by this point, um, but August 3rd through 7th, 2022 is in fact our biennial convention, which is scheduled to take place in person in Scottsdale, Arizona. And then November 8th is file for Delta Founders Day. It is also the deadline when spring calendars are due to the executive office. So we like to couple up on those dates, make sure you guys don't have too many different ones to remember. Um, I'll also do just a quick reminder of some of our current fees. Uh, most of you guys know this, but on a membership level, it's important to know that the new law student members uh, international initiation fee is currently set at $90. This is a one-time fee for lifetime membership. It is not just membership in law school. When you all graduate, you become alumni members and you are alumni members for life or until you no longer want to be. So that's a big thing. We want to make sure you know that because that is different from a lot of organizations like ours. Um, please keep in mind, too, that if a new law student member is coming into your uh, chapter and they were a pre-law, an undergraduate member, they get a discount. That's $70 instead of $90. Um, but just like the regular fee, it's a one-time fee, one and done, one-stop shop. Um, there are no fees if a student is coming from another pre-law, uh, I'm sorry, not pre-law, law chapter. Um, so if it's a direct transfer from uh, law chapter to law chapter, if there's no fees there, we just ask that you let us know so that we can update our records accordingly. One of the biggest questions that we get asked when it comes to fees is if we waive the fees ever, um, and we don't because File for Delta is a nonprofit. Those initiation fees are literally necessary for us to operate and continue to function as an organization. Uh, the fee covers individual initiation materials, the certificate and pins you guys get, um, chapter insurance. It allows us to provide free recruitment materials. It allows us to put on events, the free webinars and content that we have, um, all the member benefits that we work with. If you want to get really technical about it, I'm sure about 17 cents of that even goes into paying executive office staff salaries. So it literally, that is what um, makes us operate on a regular basis. Um, but I do think it's really important to note for recruitment purposes, um, when people are looking at that fee saying, oh my gosh, $90, what am I going to do here? Uh, the payment plans are available. We are very, very flexible with our payment plans. We are always willing to work with people. And again, that's a one-time fee for lifetime membership. You still get all those benefits and networking and everything after you graduate. Um, so when we're talking about that, that actually kind of moves us really nicely into our next section, which is recruitment, um, because I know that those that fee question always comes up when we're doing recruitment stuff. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about spring recruitment, why it's important, how it's a little bit different. Um, and so let's crack into that section. 
Um, I think spring recruitment is really important because chapters should ideally be recruiting all the time. Um, consistent intake of new members is actually the healthiest way to bring in new members as opposed to these spikes in membership where maybe you initiate a ton of people at once and then nothing else for the rest of the year. Uh, that consistent flow is going to uh, really, really benefit your chapter. It's going to bring in the most number of members overall. It's going to make those members feel more engaged and more committed to the organization. Um, so we really want to make sure that chapters know that just because it's springtime does not mean you should be forgetting about recruitment. Um, however, spring recruitment is going to be a little different than fall recruitment. We, we understand this. We know this. Um, spring is a really good time to focus on anyone who did not join last semester um, and maybe adjust your strategies a little bit for how you handle recruitment. Um, fall is naturally set up so that you're recruiting 1Ls through orientation, through student organization fairs, things like that. Um, so use the spring as a time to follow up with the people who maybe didn't join in the fall, um, but they did show interest. Maybe they signed your interest form at the recruitment table. Um, or you can focus on non-1L students who maybe felt like the fall was not focused on them anymore. Um, we just want to make sure that you know anyone can join at any time. You don't have to be a 1L. You don't have to have a certain GPA to join. We're really proud of our open membership policy. So keep that in mind that you have this whole student pool to pull from and try not to limit yourself to just these times of year that you're recruiting and just to 1Ls. Consider all of that. Um, we all know that engagement, especially lately, has been a problem. Um, I know I'm not going to sit here and claim to have a magic solution for you guys. Um, we're all a little burned out these days, and that's definitely understandable. Um, but what you should be doing is trying to get these members, these new members involved as soon as they've joined. Um, build on that enthusiasm of their their entry into Phi Alpha Delta, have them join a committee or just even attend an event. Um, as chapter officers, there should be a group effort amongst all the officers to work on a communication strategy, which could include uh, a chapter group chat, um, regular email blasts or a newsletter, and definitely social media as well. Um, everyone seems to use that these days. Um, evaluate your calendar as well and kind of see which events are doing well and which ones aren't doing well. If you're not having people show up to your chapter meetings, combine that with some kind of other event so that there's more than just chapter business to be discussed. You know, if your professional events aren't doing very well, figure out you know, did we advertise this properly? Did we give everyone enough time to really get their questions and all their information in? Really take a hard look at that. And of course, let us know if you need help. If you want any evaluation of any of those programs and uh, calendars that you guys have, get in touch with the office. We can definitely help you guys out with that. That's what we're here for. Um, if anyone else also, you know, I've mentioned a few things, but if you guys have things that you've tried or even just specific challenges that your chapter is facing, feel free to throw them in the chat. We can, we have time, we can go over them. Um, but if you have done something and you're like, hey, we found a really great solution for our school and you want to share it, now is a great time to throw that in there. So I'm all about crowdsourcing um, ideas and resources. So, um, we are now looking into the spring and so for me, new semester, new strategies. Um, what kind of things can you try in the spring that you didn't do in the fall that is not necessarily associated with those, um, you know, already set up events like orientation and recruitment fairs? Um, so one, like I already mentioned, uh, follow up with students who showed interest in PAD in the fall but didn't actually join. Um, see if they want to do that now. Uh, focus on 2Ls, 3Ls, part-time or evening students, non-traditional students, maybe people who didn't have the opportunity um, to be a part of those big fall events that, uh, that we've talked about already. I would also spend the time in the spring focusing on your chapter's connections with other organizations on campus. You can be a member of Phi Alpha Delta and a member of any other organization, as long as it's not another law fraternity. Um, so by working with other organizations, you can recruit from their membership, you can help share resources. That's a really, really great way to get your name out there. 
Um, I also suggest that you tailor your spring events to topics and programs that will help members prepare for finals and the summer. Um, you no know, one's really thinking about that kind of stuff in fall. Well, that's not fair. You guys all plan ahead. You are thinking about that kind of stuff in the fall. But now that spring is here, it really becomes a priority. And make sure that your events are a reflection of that. And they're not just a repeat of the events that you did in the fall. Um, at one point when we were when we were setting this up, like I mentioned, um, we did have some questions submitted along with our registration form. So there is one question that I do want to address. Um, one person asked how we suggest officers go about recruitment when those being recruited are more interested in joining an organization like Phi Delta Phi. For those of you who don't know, that is an honor society. Um, it's based on grades. Um, and then two, are there any plans to amend our organization's rules to allow for law students to be members of another law fraternity? Um, and so the answer, there's you know, two questions there, so two answers. Um, when it comes to the competition with the other organization, whether it's Phi Delta Phi, another honor society, another organization, um, because you can be members of both, my biggest advice with that is to work with those organizations, get together with them, find out what they're planning um, and work with them in a way that you guys can be offering something different than what they are offering. Um, there are so many things that you guys need as law students. It doesn't make sense to uh, you know, be doing all the same things at once. So sit down with those other organizations and try to work together as opposed to being focused on the competition so much. Um, and then the second question that we got, if there are any plans for Phi Alpha Delta to change the requirements in terms of being a member of uh, one fraternity and not another, um, the answer is no, not at this time. Um, and that's just, unfortunately, we are governed by the Professional Fraternity Association, and so uh, so is the other law fraternity, the other national law fraternity that I know of, which is Delta Theta Phi. Um, and so that's kind of an overarching agreement between the two organizations, um, but that organization Delta Theta Phi is, as far as I'm aware, the only national legal fraternity out there right now other than Phi Alpha Delta. Um, I think there's a few regional based ones, so we don't really have issues with that come up so much, um, but we don't have plans to change that, but it is only applicable to the one organization at this point. I um, saw a question in the chat here. Um, any suggestions for building relationships with undergraduate programs? That is a really, really great question. Um, yes, so you are more than welcome to work with undergraduate uh, organizations, whether it's a pre-law society or the Phi Alpha Delta chapter at um, a local university, your own university, whatever that may be. Um, I don't actually really see that as very different as working with any other Phi Alpha Delta chapter or organization. It's all about, you know, for if you're working with a PAD pre-law chapter, for example, getting in touch with our office, we will pass on their contact information. Um, we will make sure that you get connected. Um, and then we will, you know, we can advise you on maybe some specific events that they might like to see. Those undergrad students are always going to want to know how they can get by in law school. If you have any tips for the LSAT, how you're balancing everything. Um, and I think you can really fill that niche for them. Um, so yeah, and then Imani, I, I see your hand raised, so I'll call on you in just a second. But to answer your other question about transitioning the pre-law society into a PAD chapter, that's a great question that does need to come from the undergraduate students. They need to be the ones to take the initiative to um, change that over, to work with the, uh, the administration on campus, to work with our office. Um, so you can definitely assist them with that process, but it does need to be driven by them. them. Um, so Imani, I don't know if your hand is still raised, but if it is, um, please feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question you want to ask. Yeah, that, that you answered it exactly in the second part. I just wanted to, you know, see, ask about the process of right. that, but it would be possible for us to still put on in, an event with the uh, pre-law society, even though- A hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. They, it's definitely not required that you're stuck with just pad pre-law chapters, which that's an awful way to say stuck with. We, of course, we want you guys to be able to work with them as well. But if there's not a pad pre-law chapter and you want that connection to the undergraduate organizations, um, which can be a really great recruiting tool for you, you're recruiting them before they're even in law school, um, <laughs> definitely feel free to do that. Yeah, we are very much um, an organization that wants to be open with the other organizations in the law school level and the undergrad level. So yeah, please feel free. But as, if there's a transition process in terms of turning a pre-law organization into 
pad, they, they'll, that'll have to come from those students directly and we're happy to help them with that. Okay, great questions, great questions. All right, um, if there are no more questions on recruitment, I am gonna go ahead and move into the planning for elections section. Um, and for today's purpose, I am just gonna, gonna go over the basic process for elections, um, a little bit of comments on the virtual versus in-person and then some common issues. I will say that every single chapter is different when it comes to elections. And I have seen every problem and or positive thing under the sun. So if, you know, if there's something specific going on with your chapter, feel free to let us know. We can talk about it. We can also connect um, outside of this presentation if needed. Um, so here are the critical elements to setting up an election. Number one, advertising the open positions. Anyone who is a member in good standing may run for office and file for Delta, unless your school has any other kind of written requirement um, that references that. So when I say good standing, I mean that person has joined, they've submitted their application, they have paid the initiation fee, if you have any, what we call local dues, you know, if your chapter charges, you know, $10 a semester on, char on top of our fees, um, that they've paid those. Um, and ideally that they've been initiated as well or their initiation is coming up. Um, we're kind of flexible on that one because we understand that sometimes with timing and especially in this virtual hybrid environment, things don't always work out as planned, but that's what good standing means to us. Um, you don't have to be a specific class, 1L, 2L, 3L. It doesn't matter if you're a part-time or a full-time student. Um, and grades are also not something we consider with elections. And again, the only exception to that is if your school has a requirement of that nature. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, it's best practice that all chapter members will receive the information of what positions are available. Um, there are five main positions, but of course you can add more if your chapter would like to. Um, and it's best that everyone receives information on what the duties of those positions are. And you can find the position descriptions for those main officer roles in the chapter operations handbook. Um, when advertising elections, um, definitely set a due date for nominations. Individuals can nominate themselves or they can nominate other members. Uh, when you're collecting nominations, going on to the next step, uh, consider if you want to ask for any candidacy statements or questionnaires for your candidates. Uh, we don't suggest you make this mandatory. Uh, you simply make it an option that members may submit the information, the platform that they're running on, um, even if you do plan to have in-person candidate speeches later down the line. Moving on to step three, once you have a full slate of candidates, um, you'll want to publish that slate, um, make sure everyone knows who's running for what, and all of the logistical details that's gonna go into elections. Um, this includes when elections are going to be held, in what format, whether it's virtual, in person, or both. Um, they'll need to know when chapter members have the opportunity to hear from candidates and talk to them. Uh, personally, I think it's a good idea to have all of this stuff published way in advance so everyone has a chance to hear it. Um, and again, I also think it's a great idea to have those candidacy statements available right from the get-go. Um, but you can set things up so candidates can speak in person before voting. Whatever you want to do in that regard, we have offer a lot of flexibility. And depending on what your chapter prefers to do, we can always go through a checklist that's a little bit more detailed with that uh, than this one. Um, I believe someone actually just shared with me earlier this week, the University of South Carolina student organizations um, site has a really great checklist for stuff like that. So if you're, if you're looking at this and you're saying, I don't even know what you mean by all these details, don't worry, we can help you get there. This is just an overview. Um, keep in mind too, as you're publishing all these details, you can allow candidates to speak for themselves. They can, they can give their own speeches, things like that. Um, but you can also have other members speak for them in support. This can be in addition to them speaking or um, in replacement for. This is actually something we do for our national file for Delta elections. If any of you guys have been to convention or plan to be, you will hopefully see this in action in, in August. So keep that in mind. Uh, step four is the, the most critical part, conducting the voting itself. Um, <laughs> if you're in person, you can do this just by a, a hand raise. You can do a secret paper ballot. You can do a verbal vote. It's really up to you, but I would suggest, again, making those decisions uh, before the process starts so that everyone knows exactly how things are going to go. Um, if it's virtual, it's a good idea to set up a voting period that might be 48 to 72 hours to allow everyone to vote electronically. 
And then finally, once the uh, voting is complete, you can publicize the results to the chapter, share that information with the executive office, share that with your school, and start setting up the officer transition, uh, which again, we're gonna go over um, in the next few slides. So make sure that you are sharing that information with everybody so that we can get our records updated, the school can get their records updated, and that way you guys as outgoing officers aren't getting emails from us uh, after you've already graduated saying, hey, uh, are you still running the chapter? <laughs> um, right now, there is a mix of what chapters are doing in, in terms of virtual versus in-person elections. Uh, so that is something we do allow you to determine for yourself. When, when you're deciding which of the two options to go for, I suggest that you consider what is easiest for you all as chapter officers. Um, what is safest for your members, depending on what's going on in your individual geographic area, um, and what is the most accessible for your members. If you have a large portion of, this, of your membership who are only doing online classes, it's not going to make sense to do in-person elections. They might not even be in the state. They can't do that. So really consider ease of access, safety, and accessibility when you're making those decisions. Um, there are benefits to one or the other, depending on how you feel. Um, for example, for the in-person, you can have people present their candidacy statements live. There's a chance for questions. It's usually a faster process because you're all there together. Um, but at the same time, it it limits participation because if someone can't attend that in-person session, um, you know, th they're going to miss out on the opportunity to hear from the candidates and to vote. Um, then, you know, you look at the virtual side of things. It's much more streamlined. It's, uh, it, there's an opportunity to publish things to a wider audience. But the flip side of that is it usually takes longer. You need to give people more time to vote in a virtual environment. Like I said, that 48 to 72 hours. There's less chance for the candidates to interact with members, which depending on your perspective could be a good or a bad thing. That's just up to your chapter. Um, so keep all of that in mind. If you do choose to have virtual elections, um, I highly suggest a, uh, a very simple platform, something like Google Forms. I've personally helped chapters set up Google Forms for their elections. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you can do SurveyMonkey, something like that, um, or even double check and see if there's if your school has a platform, uh, something like Twen. I'm not sure if that still offers elections uh, opportunities right now, but uh, keep in mind that you have options and we don't require you to choose one over the other. Um, with the way that the world is right now, you may also want to consider a hybrid approach to elections, which means there's a virtual and an in-person element. Um, and when I say hybrid, I, I kind of mean, you know, have a event like a candidate forum where all of those candidates can get together together. Um, share their platforms, they can have speak for themselves, have members speak in support of them. Um, but then everyone kind of goes home, has a few days to think about it, and you would do the actual voting virtually. Um, so that, that might be a hybrid option if you're interested in kind of going for the best of both worlds. Um, I do suggest if you do that, still create the opportunity where either electronically through pre-prepared written statements or through recording or Zoom or whatever that you do have that available to people who can't make it in person. Um, moving on to common election issues. Again, like I said, I've seen just about everything under the sun when it comes to elections. <laughs> and um, that doesn't mean we won't have new problems come up and that's fine, we'll, we'll address them. But here are some of the most common ones that we see in the executive office. Um, so issue number one, participation from chapter members. And in this sense, I just mean actually not having people vote. Um, so it's important to remember um, if you can't get everyone together in a room, again, virtual might be the way to go. That's usually the first thing I suggest if people are saying, oh, I, I can't make it to vote. I, I don't want to go to a candidate forum, that kind of thing. Consider switching to virtual. Um, we consider quorum 20% of your chapter's membership in good standing. So if you can't even get the 20% to vote, that's a situation where you're going to want to contact me directly. We do have some provisions in some of our governing documents for how I can assist you, how some of the volunteers like your, your chapter advisors and district justices can assist you in those processes. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're, if you're not getting your 20% quorum, um, please contact us. But as long as you've gotten that, you're clear to proceed. There's no other requirement in terms of the threshold you need to meet, unless for some reason you're 
chapter has written that into your bylaws on your own. So double check that, um, but that's usually the standard that, that we look at. Um, the next issue I want to talk about is uh, contentious elections. Uh, we all know elections can get nasty, um, unless, you know, anyone's been living under a rock for the past eight to 12 years. Um, if you feel like this is going to be an issue, my biggest piece of advice is to invite a faculty advisor, a PAD volunteer to oversee the election process, someone who's a neutral third party and can just say, hey, here's the best way, here's best practices, I've done this before, I can kind of intervene. Um, um, usually it's a good thing. Everyone is so passionate. They have so many great ideas. doesn't mean everyone has to agree, um, but it does mean that you should still maintain a level of fraternalism and professionalism that uh, our organization really aspires to. So having a third party uh, to help you monitor those elections might be the best way to go if you do feel like things are getting a little contentious. Uh, the next issue uh, that I know people asked about um, when they signed up to is what do you do if you don't have any candidates? Um, and so that can kind of go one of two ways. Um, if you don't have all the candidates to fill all the open positions, my advice is to fill what positions you can while focusing on the primary positions that are going to be really critical for chapter operations. All officer positions are important, don't get me wrong, but having a justice and a treasurer are the two that I suggest the most because um, the justice is obviously the head of chapter operations, while the treasurer is in charge of the funding and the money, and those are the two big things that really make the chapter run. Um, so if you can't get a full slate, go for what you can while trying to fill those really important positions first and kind of filling in from there. Um, Imani, great question. Should we still have a candidate form if only one person signs up for each position? Um, I don't know if I'd necessarily suggest a whole forum where everyone speaks, um, but I do think it's important for candidates if they feel if they feel they want to to submit candidacy statements. And again, that's part of not making that process mandatory. I never suggest that it's mandatory. Um, so candidates can choose not to participate that in that if they want. Um, but if even if you, there's only one person running for a position, I think it would still be important for the chapter members to hear what that person wants to do in their, uh, hopefully in their new position. So yeah, I, I, I do think that you could do that. Um, if you can't get anyone to run for office, um, then you guys, you need to start doing a little bit more individualized outreach to your chapter members. Don't just send a mass email and hope that people are going to respond. Um, see who's been to the events and the programs, who's been involved, who might be a new member and they really want to do something with the chapter. Um, and that is the duty of all of the chapter officers, not just the justice. This should be a group effort um, to really start reaching out to people and saying, hey, we need to be able to continue this organization. Um, would you be willing to step up and serve as an officer? Um, so that that's the biggest thing that I ask for. It does require a little bit of legwork. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, but it, it will pay off because the alternative is having you know the chapter activity drop down. And then you kind of get stuck in this cycle that it's hard to get out of. Um, if no current chapter members want to run for office, recruit new members. That's why, again, if you've started this process in February and you know by mid-February that none of the current chapter members are stepping up, but you know someone from another organization that you're involved in who you think would be a great officer, have them join Phi Alpha Delta, have them run. That's totally fine. And that is not unheard of for very small chapters where there is not a lot of interest in elections. Uh, that can sometimes be uh, the best thing that a chapter can do. So keep that in mind. Um, and as always, if you're getting to a point where you're like, wow, it's really, it's, it's no one is stepping up, get in touch with us. We will see if we can help um, and see what we can get involved with and aren't. Um, last common election issue that I see, um, and this is really kind of unique to the last like year and a half, two years, it's just tech issues because so many people have been doing elections virtually. Just know that things happen, kind of mentally prepare, have a backup plan. Um, understand that if, if needed, you can always redo the elections and say, oh no, our tech system messed up. For some reason, half the chapter didn't get the ballot. We're gonna do this again. So sorry, everybody, please re-vote. Um, I think we can all have a little bit of grace and understanding that things go that way. Um, Tim, I see your hand. Yeah, do you have a question? Hi, I do have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, it is okay for 
members and officers to make statements on behalf of a candidate who is running for a position. Mm -hmm. I want to clarify, do you recommend against an outgoing officer making a statement recommending a particular candidate? And if you don't recommend wholesale against it, do you have any advice on how to encourage competition nevertheless? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, And I'm gonna give you a really lawyer answer, which is it depends. Um, I don't discourage current chapter officers, outgoing chapter officers from having um, a voice in the elections. What you want to avoid is a situation where if you you have candidate A and candidate B, candidate A has been endorsed by the board and they're getting all the support, and then candidate B feels they've been unfairly left out of the process, Um, almost that candidate A was uh, groomed for this situation and they're not getting the fair opportunity. So I don't think it's any problem for any individual member, officer or not, to say, hey, I'd like to speak in support of Tim, who's running for justice, and say, you know, I have worked with them and, and I think they've done really well. But again, it needs to be done in a way where the outgoing board is not basically hand selecting a new batch of officers because that is a very unfair election process. We are very against that. So that's where the it depends comes in. Um, So short answer to your question, it is fine for current officers to speak on behalf, um, but have a really candid conversation with yourself. You know, can you go in, you still have to administer the elections and be impartial. Can you do that while still, you know, putting your own feelings and say, hey, I'm speaking as Tim and not as Alden Chapter Justice. So if you can do that, great. But if not, you know, kind of just think about that. You guys are all going to be lawyers. You know very much the difference between in conflict of interest. So I I think we can trust you guys to, to kind of evaluate that. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, Any other questions on the planning for elections process before I move into the transitions part of this presentation? Okay, seeing none, let's keep going. Um, All right, so now ideally you have your new officers. You've, You've had your elections, everything went great. No problems at all. You had a wonderful election. Um, now it's time for the new officers to take over. Um, this process is very subjective in the sense that your chapter can decide for itself what the best way to go about this. It can be a long-term process against two months, or it can be a single meeting. You guys all sit down in the room together for a few hours and you and you really get all this stuff done. It can be everyone all together, you know, all the outgoing officers, all the incoming officers. Or you can individually work, say, have the outgoing justice meet with the incoming justice, outcoming vice justice with the incoming and and et cetera down the line. Um, It can doesn't have to all be right away. If the current officers are like, hey, we've got a lot of really great events and programs we want to see through through the end of February into March. So let's plan for, you know, beginning of April to get all of this stuff done. Great. You can definitely do that. Um, The idea is really with this long this long window is that the uh, incoming officers can almost shadow the outgoing officers or have the outgoing officers available as resources as they're getting all of this stuff set up. Um, When you're doing all of these things, one of the biggest thing I suggest is really just thinking on a practical level. If you are an outgoing officer, what do I wish I knew when I was coming into this, and that is the information you need to then share with the incoming officers. So there's a checklist here. Um, This checklist is in the new officer resource guide, which um, all new officers get when you report that to the executive office. I send out an email welcoming them, introducing myself, saying, hey, here's your your quick guide. Here's all the stuff that you need to get done now. Um, And then following up with some of the other resources later. So again, new officer guide, I'll kind of go over where to find that later. But here is the checklist of all of the things that you need to do. Transferring accounts, transferring uh, signatories, chapter files, discussing duties um, over, you know, that's a lot of very basic physical stuff, you know, even picking up the chapter banner and saying, hey, here you go. This is yours now. Um, Sharing contact information for school officials. If you have someone you work with to request rooms or request funding, all of that kind of thing. 
Um, when you're doing all of this stuff, there's a few best practices to keep in mind. Um, one, you would ideally, hopefully have some kind of physical material to turn over to the new officers, whether this is a binder with information, um, you know, flash drive with files, or even just maybe set up a Google Drive that has all of our current manuals and documents from both our office and from your school. That's a great thing to have. Um, again, like I said before, think about what you wish you'd known coming into your officer role and really format your transition process around that. Um, for new or potential new officers, if, if you're on this call and you're thinking about running for office again next year, um, keep you know, notes during this process and say, hey, uh, you know, I really need to follow up with so-and-so and say, hey, uh, I actually don't know how to request a chapter room for a meeting. Can you make sure you go over that with me? All that kind of fun stuff. Um, the two biggest contacts that I always, always suggest that uh, officers, like at the bare minimum, if you're not doing anything else, make sure that you've connected your incoming officers to whoever runs your bank account. You do not want to lose those funds. I can't do anything for you once, that trans once that's over. You know, I don't have access to your funding. Um, so make sure those accounts get transferred over. That is the biggest issue that we tend to see. Um, and then also really make sure, again, that your school is aware that you've had elections, because if you're not considered um, a chapter in good standing at that point, that can be a whole process as well. <laughs> so um, and then keep in mind, too, that you should also probably share contact information with each other. If you're a graduating outgoing officer, I totally understand you've got the bar exam coming up. You're probably not going to be available until August. But still share that contact information because you never know once the fall semester starts if someone's going to say, hey, didn't remember to ask this during our transition, but where's our chapter gavel? I can't find it. You're going to want to make sure that, you know, that process is ongoing. The best way to ensure continued health for your chapter is to not just completely drop the chapter once you graduate. You want to kind of try to stay involved and help them continue on. Another part of transitioning is going to be your district leadership and transition conference, which is planned by your district justice. Um, some of you might've already heard about plans for your district's conference. Um, if you haven't yet, you will soon. Um, that meeting is actually, it's all of the incoming and outgoing officers for the whole district getting together talking about some of these processes, getting a really basic introduction to Phi Alpha Delta. Um, so that's gonna go into a lot more details about some of the topics that we've gone over today. And then again, much more information on district operations and chapter operations in general. So keep that in mind. Um, that's gonna be something that's gonna be really, really helpful for you guys as well. And again, that takes place in the spring so that you have the, uh, the summer and everything to plan. You don't have to come into the fall semester trying to figure it out as you go. So that uh, covers my transition checklist. Any questions on that before we move on to event planning? Okay, great. Seeing none, moving on. Chapter, planning chapter events and programs. Uh, we have a lot of information in the uh, chapter operations guide in terms of programming requirements and listed uh, examples. There's a whole list in the appendix, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. My biggest advice is to really uh, take a look at that guide, use those resources we've provided, um, and uh, let us know, too, if you want your past chapter calendars from previous semesters. That's one of the biggest reasons we ask you guys to turn those in. And so there's a record of what the chapter has done in the past and new officers are not reinventing the wheel every time it comes in. So when you're looking for ideas and advice, look at the resources that we have, look at your own chapter records and really kind of think about those things um, and how you can adapt them. Um, I definitely suggest um, when you are planning that you work with other organizations to co-sponsor and share resources. Not only does this help with the recruitment stuff we talked about earlier, but I know that there's not as much funding out there for student organizations as there was before. Don't be afraid to share those resources that you get with, uh, with another organization. Um, and you can put on an event together. They may have other resources that can help you out, whether it's connections to speakers, actual money, um, you know, uh, access to a physical location. So co-sponsoring events, really good way to go, especially if you're not sure where to start with planning. Uh, my other advice with planning uh, your calendar is to double up on event categories. We have quite a few event categories listed out in the chapter operations guide. 
but they can overlap. Um, so for example, professional development events and alumni networking events, you can definitely create an event that fulfills both of those needs and requirements. Um, and like I mentioned before too, um, double up on event times. If you, if you wanna have a chapter meeting and then a social event afterwards, great. That's only one thing people need to put in their calendar as opposed to two different things. I know you guys are busy, so it makes a lot of sense to be doubling up in that regard. Um, and my last piece of big advice with uh, just general planning is to have kind of a niche on campus, a signature event that you're known for, that you can continue year after year. Um, it's a really great way to really build your brand on campus. We highly suggest it. And it doesn't have to be a particularly massive event. It doesn't have to be the blowout event of the year. It can just be something you're really good at and something that you're consistently providing to the student body. When it comes to you know, planning these chapter events and programs in modern times, we need to know that there's a possibility we'll need to move virtual or move to a hybrid environment. Um, I primarily plan the events for PADS national office, things like our mock trial competition, co convention, all that stuff. So I know how frustrating it is. If you ever wanna commiserate about it, give me a call. Um, but my biggest piece of advice is to just be flexible and understand that things are not always gonna go perfectly. Um, have virtual backup plans, consider a nice mix of in-person and virtual events. So if one or the other doesn't work out, you're not left with zero events at all. Um, and then my biggest virtual event that I've seen that has done so well are the alumni panels. They are popping up all over because now you can do these virtual alumni panels with alumni from all over the country. Um, and so please don't be afraid to use those even when we do go back to primarily in-person events. Um, that's a really, really great way to build connections to show off to your members who is in this organization because things can differ geographically. There might not be a ton of PAD alumni in your area, but there's certainly a lot in Washington, D.C. or Boston, and I'm sure they would be more than happy to help you out. And I do kind of call them out specifically because I know those district justices are on this call today, um, and they have been very helpful in uh, making connections for students, so keep that in mind. Um, last thing with events that I want to talk about before we go into convention specifically is um, to consider what kind of national events and programs our office is putting on and don't be afraid to use them and advertise them among your members and among potential new members. Again, I'm very big on crowdsourcing resources and ideas. Don't be afraid to use our stuff. We have an ongoing uh, speaker series. The next presentation is actually next week on being a government attorney. We have another session coming up in March. These are free, usually monthly events. They take place in the evenings. They are recorded. You can always participate in those and put them on your chapter calendar. Um, we will offer you content from our benefit partners. Um, you actually, when you guys got emailed yesterday with a reminder about this event, there were a couple of those organizations listed who will come and they will do events with your chapter. So don't be afraid to reach out to them. It is free to you. Again, that's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we do all this work to get this stuff set up for you guys so that you can just call them, email them, and they can come in and help you get everything set up. Uh, we are going to have, you know, additional ongoing webinars and content from our partners, from our speaker series. They're always going to be posted on the PAD.org calendar, which I'm going to show you later. Um, so keep that in mind and really take a look at that um, at when you guys are planning your own chapter events, see what you can partner um, on. And think about participation in other chapters events as well. Um, some chapters have opened up their virtual or even their in-person events to other chapters. Um, people are getting really great about sharing those events with us. And again, they go on the national calendar. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like in a little bit so that you can see where all of those things are coming up. Any event planning questions before we move on, before I move on to my last slide and uh, wrap up here? Okay, great. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is convention 2022. Again, and that's going to be this August. Um, and it's really important that you guys are planning for that now, even if you're outgoing officers, because if there's time now to be requesting funding, um, that's the thing you're going to want to be doing. It's your responsibility to tell these incoming officers that they need to be planning for this. So really, really focus on it. Um, if you are graduating this year, I, I do want to point out specifically that there are a lot of grants that are for recently graduated alumni. So if you want to come and you're like, wow, how would I afford this on top of the bar exam? 
let us know. We can help you out. <laughs> um, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, convention is held every two years. So the last time we had it was 2020. So if you're on this right now and you're like, wow, I've never even heard of this, it's not because you missed something last year. It's because there wasn't convention last year. Um, so every two years, we're really excited to be going back to in-person. Um, and basically what we do at convention, for those who don't know, is a really great mix of networking, workshops, keynote speakers, fraternity business, like elections that I mentioned earlier, um, and honestly, a lot of fun too. It's a really great environment for networking and social events. This is the event where we get together our law student chapters and our alumni chapters and alumni members. So you guys are interacting with your fellow law students from across the country. You're interacting with alumni from across the country. Um, and so it's really important to build those connections and be a participant in the process of our organization. Um, that's why attendance is so really, really critical. You want your chapter to have a voice in the next International Executive Board and all of the other things that get discussed at convention. Um, so each chapter is entitled to two votes. Those are those delegates I was talking about earlier. Um, so as many people can go as they want, but you've got these two votes that you can use. And it's really important that as a chapter, you sit down and decide who's going to go and represent your chapter on behalf of all of you. Um, it's important to note, too, that uh, Delegates don't have to be chapter officers. They definitely can be, but I understand if officers aren't available, it's perfectly fine for someone else to attend on behalf of the chapter. So keep that in mind. Uh, we're in the process now, obviously, of planning our 2022 convention. Um, so we do have some information on our website, but the full agenda is not going to be available probably for at least another, you know, a few you know, closer to March, April, May time with our workshops and keynotes. That obviously takes a lot of work to plan. Um, so for now, feel free to check out some of, you know, the funding options that we have. Like I mentioned, we have tons and tons of grant options. Those are all available now. The application period is open. The deadline is May 31st. Um, in terms of other funding, we do offer delegate stipends. That information is being finalized now as well, but essentially every, that first delegate from your chapter is going to, from our office, get options for uh, funding for their registration fee or for, or for travel reimbursement. So keep an eye out for that information on that coming soon. Um, and because we are, you know, a few months out from convention at this point, um, now is a good time to be fundraising. You can spend all semester fundraising to help your delegate get to convention in August. Uh, apply for funding from your school now. Have it in the account. Uh, make sure it's ready to go. Um, so let's see here. All right. Uh, when it comes to then how do you actually select these delegates, um, really the, the best way to do that is to get together in a chapter meeting, see who is available to attend convention, who wants to attend convention, and then just make a have a simple vote, say, yep, you know, uh, I'd like to attend convention. Great. You can be our first delegate. That's usually as easy as it goes. It doesn't have to be a massively formal process unless you want it to be. Um, and we are going to have some forms on our site available in the coming weeks where you can officially report your delegates so that we know on our side who's going to be voting. We can get all of that stuff organized. Um, does anyone have any questions about convention? You guys are going to hear a lot about it in the next few months. So I don't want to overwhelm you, but I, I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to stop my share here um, because I do want to wrap up my part of the presentation today by going through um, actually the file for Delta website just a little bit. I know we have so, so much <laughs> on the website. And so uh, there's a few things in particular I want to show you. Um, so right now you guys are looking at the home screen. This is the file for Delta website. You've seen this probably a million times. This is our homepage. Um, I do suggest just so you know, it looks a little different on mobile. So if you're having trouble finding something, maybe switch over to the desktop version and take a look at that. Um, but I wanna give you a quick walkthrough of some of our most common links and resources before we wrap up today, especially as you're going into election planning season. Um, so here in these big squares that you'll see are some of the most common links that we have. You know, this is the online application where you can direct new members. Here's our member benefits, our online store, our upcoming events, all of those kinds of fun things. 
I will show you here our events calendar. Here, look, here's our sessions. There's ours and the pre-law session going on at once. Um, but, you know, so you can see what's going on there. You can see all the things we have coming up, our next speaker series, keep that in mind. Um, our online store is pretty big because people always ask, hey, where do I go to pay my fees? This is it. You can buy a t-shirt and you can pay your initiation fees here as well in that join pad section. So that's a really big one for you guys to know. Um, and then the other main thing that you guys will probably use from the site is not only our career center, which we do consider one of our member benefits, but the full benefits page itself. This has more information on some of those partners I've been talking about, some of the people and companies that were mentioned in our uh, in the email that went out yesterday, things like Access Lex, JD Advising, Kaplan Test Prep, Themis, all of these guys are happy to work with you guys and we can work with you as well. Um, a few specific resources I wanna point you to. Um, here under this members tab, is a really important section to be looking at. You guys are gonna to wanna to go for law, obviously, because you're law chapters. Um, and we've got two thing, a few things here uh, also underneath that are really big. One, transferring membership. So we talked about the students who might come from another law chapter or from an undergraduate chapter. They can do this at this transfer membership page. That's gonna bring them to the appropriate links. Uh, we've got some virtual resources that I'm going to go over a minute in a minute, but I'm going to start here in this main law page. This is something that I suggest you guys bookmark. Um, you can see where all the chapters are. You can see our overarching resources and policies, additional information about a lot of stuff that's important just to you guys. And then for you, the be all end all page, in my opinion, is the resources for file for Delta law chapter officers. We put this together with just about everything we commonly get asked for. How do I get a chapter roster? How do I set up a payment plan for the initiation fee? Getting recruitment materials. All of these guides I've been talking about, the new officer guide, a uh, operations guide, all of that stuff. There even is, and this is going to be updated later, the chapter operations webinar. This is actually where we're going to put the recording of this session. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> So all of this here and then down here at the bottom, these important dates and deadlines that I went over. So in case you lose your, your sticky note that you wrote them down on, they're all here on this page here. Um, some people did ask specifically about uh, virtual resources and, you know, uh, recruitment resources, things like that. That's where some of this, these uh, virtual resources come in that, I, that I've pulled up. There's some information about holding virtual events and the recruitment resources is definitely something I want to draw your attention to. Um, this has recruitment materials um, that you can view and download, things like uh, templates, all that kind of fun stuff, Zoom wallpapers, even if you want your background to look like mine, <laughs> all of that kind of fun stuff. Um, so definitely keep that in mind as you're on the website. I know there's a lot on here. Um, and so that's kind of why I just wanted to take a few minutes to highlight some of these um, really important areas of the site that you guys should know about. And again, my biggest piece of advice is this keeping this uh, law officer resources page, um, keeping that bookmarked because nine times out of 10, if you have a question about something and you need a quick answer, it's going to be on this page. So, Great. Okay, great. So I am going to stop sharing. Um, I know we are coming up on an hour, which is, you know, just about what we expected. I am more than happy to now open this up to questions, to discussion. Um, I'm certainly in no rush to jump off the call. Um, so if anyone has questions, now is the time. Please raise your hand or throw them in the chat. It doesn't matter how big, small, or specific it is. We're, that's what we're here for today. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any right now. So I'm going to go ahead and just at least stop our recording for the day.